Why doesn't NASA remove the artifacts from JWST images? How would the TRAPPIST-1 planets look from their surface? Why don't they just form space telescope lenses from liquid glass in space? And in Q&A+, what shape does the solar gravitational lens look like? Answering all these questions and more in this question show. It's time for the question show. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are across my channel. If a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I will answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Hi Mars, how would the TRAPPIST-1 system's planets look if we were standing on one of them? Would they appear large due to their fairly big size and proximity, or would they look like dots similar to how we view Venus? So because the planets in the TRAPPIST-1 system are part of a red dwarf system, they are a lot closer to the star. And that the separation between the planets is more similar to the distance between the Earth and the Moon. For example, the Earth is 150 million kilometers away from the Sun, while the Moon is only about 400,000 kilometers away from the Earth. And the distance between the TRAPPIST-1 planets and their star is more on that scale, 600,000 kilometers here, a million kilometers there, but not 150 million kilometers away. And so they would look, when you think about it, you know, some of these planets are the size of the Earth. And so when you think about the size of the moon, the moon is a fraction of the size of the Earth. And yet these things are going to be a lot closer. So yeah, if you were in the TRAPPIST-1 system, and you were looking out into space, you would see these disks that would be like the moon, but a few times bigger, uh, and depending on their distance. Right, so you would see an object that is three or four times bigger than the moon, and then you see one that's three times as big, one that's about the size of the moon, and then some that are smaller than the moon. But it would look totally different. It would look a lot more like those sort of science fiction artwork where you see all of these planets in the sky, as opposed to what we see, which are yeah, a little bright dot in the sky, and then when you actually zoom in with a telescope, does it resolve into a disk? But you could just see these with your own eyeballs. Thomas O'Neill, why doesn't NASA filter out the star artifacts from the James Webb telescope photos? I think they're annoying. So the artifacts that you're talking about are those six pointed uh, stars, the, the flares that are coming off of all of the stars. And those are caused by the uh, hexagonal shape of the mirrors on James Webb. And if you look really carefully, there's actually two more, there's eight. And those the additional two are caused by the struts that are on the side that are holding the secondary mirror out on James Webb. And you see that on the Hubble Space Telescope, except it's four and it comes from the mount that's holding the secondary mirror on the Hubble Space Telescope. And they're called diffraction spikes. And they are just like a natural cause of you having something that is in the way of your telescope. And it's just part of what is, what is there. So I mean, the thing that scientists want is that they don't want you to mess with the data. They want you to just download their data and not nobody touch it. And then they have the purest, best possible data that they can then work with to try and and you know do whatever research that they're doing. And so if somebody went and took data from James Webb and cleaned up all of those diffraction spikes, people would lose their minds, they would be so angry. And so you know, you are looking over the shoulder at the scientists, the astronomers who are doing their work. And it's kind of not for you. You know, like, I'm, I'm grateful that people are taking the time to to t turn what is valuable scientific astronomical data and turn it into something that that we can enjoy and appreciate and look at and and gaze with wonder. Um, but but it's a tool, it's it's got a job to do. And it's working hard. And, uh, you know, we just have to kick back and, and enjoy what they're doing and not try to mess with the data. Finn Erickson, with the solar orbiter hitting a speed of over 600,000 kilometers per hour, is a mission to the gravitational lens from the sun in sight. The problem with the solar orbiter and the Parker Solar Probe going those ridiculously high speeds is that they only get to do that when they're at the closest point to the sun, the perihelion. But then they slow down in their orbit when they get out to the very farthest point in their orbit, the aphelion. 
and then they come back down and they go really fast around the sun and they go slow when they get back out to the farthest point. You've got to be able to uh, be able to go that high speed for the entire journey. Now, there are some interesting orbits that you can do. There's this thing called the Oberth maneuver where you fire your engines when you're really close to a gravitational body and you get this multiplication of your speed that can get you out there. But we're looking at ludicrous distances. When you think about how far the Voyagers have gone in 50 years, you've got to go several times farther to be able to get out to the solar gravitational lens. And we just don't have that. So it's going to be new technologies, you know, maybe laser sails, maybe nuclear rockets, maybe vision powered ion drives, they're going to be able to give you that kind of velocity, magnetic sails, electric sails, you know, there's a lot of interesting technology that have been proposed. But the problem is that none of this is being tested in space, where we can really find out if this is going to work or not. So right now, there is no feasible way to get out to the solar gravitational lens in a human lifetime. Like if you're willing to wait 150 years, we could get out there. But we want it now. Uh, but I've interviewed people who've talked about ideas that will get you out there in 15 years, 10 years. So the ideas are there. It's just that the technology has not been tested in space. And if I was in charge of NASA, I would be testing these kinds of technologies in space. Ian Matthews, can we view the unobservable universe by using a quadrupled gravitational lens? So a gravitational lens acts like a natural telescope lens. It allows you to magnify uh, more distant objects so that you can see them with greater clarity, that you can then perform spectroscopy to understand the chemicals that are in that more distant galaxy. It's what allowed the Hubble Space Telescope to see galaxies that were just like less than a billion years after the Big Bang. But they still don't let you see anything that is going faster than the speed of light. And so it'll allow you to see the things that you can see the things that are within the observable universe with higher resolution. In other words, it's a you know, it is a magnifying glass, it lets you see that galaxy with greater resolution. But it doesn't let you see things that are outside of the observable universe, because that would require light to travel faster than the speed of light. And light doesn't do that it just travels at the speed of light. And so really, the brick wall of our observable universe is the cosmic microwave background radiation. This is that radiation that was released 380 ish thousand years after the Big Bang. And that's when the entire universe was opaque before that and was finally able to release photons into the universe. And so we can't see beyond that, because that is the earliest point in time that we can see it's not the distance, it's the time. And that's the beginning of the time that we can see. It's time to shout out our new patrons at the $5 level and above. Brad W. Nelson, Lori, Michael Zakrajasek, Michael Wolf, Christian Zickert, Robert Cordova, Brian Bodie, Daniel Donaldson, Dedaluz, and Lynn. Join our community at patreon.com slash universe today. Coco, what will the Nancy Grace Telescope achieve? How will this enhance our knowledge of the universe? So the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope, this is going to be the next great observatory that's going to be launched by NASA. It's going to be launching in 2027. And it is a telescope that is actually a hand me down from the Air Force. So uh, about 20 years ago or so, the US Reconnaissance Office gave NASA two of its old telescope mirrors that were Hubble class. So 2.5 mirror mirrors. And we're like, we don't need them. These aren't big enough for the telescopes that we have watching the Earth. So maybe you can use them for something. And NASA went and tried to figure out what they were going to do with them. And they weren't able to figure out what to do with both of them. But one of them, they're going to use for the Nancy Grace Roman telescope. And it is an infrared telescope like uh, James Webb. But unlike James Webb, and unlike Hubble, it has a really wide field of view. So while both James Webb and Hubble are very much like looking through a tiny straw at one tiny little object, you know, you could hold a, a hair at whatever some you know 50 meters away, like that's how big the object is. Nancy Grace Roman is going to be seeing a much wider field of view. And it has the latest technology on board. And so it's going to be taking these shots of large swaths of the sky. And its sort of primary job is to map out the distribution of dark matter throughout the age of the cosmos. So it's essentially taking pictures of the shape of light 
that is coming from and passing by distant galaxies, galaxy clusters, and then using that to then be able to figure out where all the dark matter is in the universe. But it's going to be able to do a ton of other things as well. They equipped it with a prototype of a coronagraph, the kind of thing that's going to be on the upcoming Habitable Worlds Observatory. And so it will be capable of observing, directly observing, Jupiter-like planets orbiting around sun-like stars. Now, obviously, what we want is to see Earth-like worlds orbiting around sun-like stars, but that'll have to be the next technology. Nancy Grace Roman is going to be doing this intermediate technology. So it'll be able to see exo Jupiters directly, which will be really interesting. And then it's going to be detecting tons and tons of exoplanets. It's going to be doing these big wide field views. And so it's going to be able to detect transits that are going on throughout this entire field of view. It's going to detect uh, gravitational microlensing, watching as planets are passing in front of their stars and distorting them with their gravity. Um, so there's going to be like a lot of really interesting science that's going to come from Nancy Grace Roman. And I think, you know, when it actually does launch, it's going to feel like James Webb too, that there's going to be so much really interesting science that's coming out of it. And specifically the kinds of scientific questions that the astronomical community is struggling with right now. Um, how many exoplanets are out there? Um, what is the nature of dark matter? What is the nature of dark energy? You know, these are the kinds of questions that Nancy Grace Roman was designed to help answer. Blasty, could we make huge convex lenses in orbit by gently spinning a large blob of glass in microgravity? Theoretically, yes, there have been a bunch of proposals to do something like this. And in fact, I've reported on this several times, there was a recent NASA NIAC grant where someone was proposing that you would have some kind of fluid inside a bag, and then you would you would spin it, and it would uh, flatten out and then it would take on the shape of a convex mirror. Uh, the faster you spin it, right, the, the more the material is trying to get to the sides of this of this container. And so it hollows out a bit and that gives you a, a convex surface. Um, Edward Balaban is the researcher who's doing that. And so you can sort of look at liquid mirrors in space uh, and see his research and see the interview that I did here on the channel. I think his idea was like you would spin it and then you would try to make it solidify and then you would coat it. So there's, there's lots of ways you could approach this. And so yeah, I mean, like, like, once you're out in space, there's a lot of really interesting ideas on what you can do that you can rotate things um, that you can create mirrors just purely through other kinds of physical forces. But it has downsides as well. But yeah, look for Edward Balaban's work. And you'll see sort of interviews and articles about it. And, and hopefully that's what you're looking for. Did you know that you can watch the same video with no ads and get a bonus question over on Patreon completely for free? We call it Q&A Plus. This week's bonus question is all about the shape of the solar gravitational lens. And I'll put a link in the show notes. All right, those are all the questions that we had this week. Thank everyone for watching. Um, now, we record this show normally every uh, Monday at five o'clock somewhere in the world, but we're about to go on our live stream hiatus. And so the last live stream that we're going to do is on next Monday. So when you're watching this, the next Monday, that's going to be the last live stream at 5 p.m. Pacific time. And then we will be back uh, at the beginning of September. So July and August, no live streams. Now, we're still going to be producing all of our regular uh, content. We're going to have Space Bites, interviews, and the Q&As will be coming from the enormous backlog of live stream stuff. So it won't feel like anything is different except for the live streams. All right, I'm going to talk about some shows that I'm going to be watching this summer. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew Gross, Bray Lake Roofing, Brian Bodie, Caridwin, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Bailock, Cy Nelson, David Gilton, and David Matz, Dustin Cable, Evan Pro, Greg Feely, Hudson Moore, James Clark, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Marcel Smith, Michael Purcell, Modso, Paul Robeck, Ren Kaidu, Robeck, Sean Sargent, Stephen Fowler Munley, Vlad Shiplin, and Wolfgang Klotz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. So there's a bunch of TV shows that I am watching right now, and I am looking forward to watching uh, in the next couple of months this summer. And I thought, you know, if you are wondering what you should be watching this summer, you should follow along. So the first one, this has already started, and this is Rick and Morty. And I, I don't know what season we're on, season a million or something. But uh, yeah, they're good. Uh, you know, it's the usual. Like, I'm not as obsessed with Rick and Morty as I once was, but still, I enjoy them. I find them funny. I keep watching them. 
Next up is Foundation, and we're going to see season three of Foundation on Apple+. Plus. And like, I'm torn about Foundation. It is not the Foundation book series. It is a stylized uh, version of the story that had a lot of issues with it. But still, I am enjoying it. And I really like the world building, and I like some of the ideas that they've included. So it is worth watching. Now, this isn't sci-fi, but uh, The Bear Season 4 is coming out in like a week. And The Bear is like one of my favorite shows. So if you've never seen The Bear, I think it's on Disney+. Plus. Go and catch up, and then you can watch the new season. And next is Star Trek Strange New Worlds Season 3. And this is my favorite recent Star Trek show. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't, like see, Deep Space Nine, Next Generation, Old Show, Strange New Worlds... Voyager, I know some people will have problems with that, but but you know, that's sort of my my take on it. And uh, but it's great. It sort of like has the theme of the old show, but also has a more modern take on it. And the stories are are more uh popcorn, but I'm really enjoying it. So that's coming up shortly. And then the last show, which is kind of a mystery, I don't know about this one, is Alien Earth. And this is gonna be a precursor to the Alien movie. And so it's going to be set on Earth, and it's a prequel before they sent Ripley and the rest of the team to the Alien world and where they met the Alien for the first time. So I don't know. It could be great. It could be terrible. We're going to have to find out. All right. Those are going to be some of the shows I'll be watching, and uh, hopefully you'll get a chance to watch some other stuff. But if you see anything that I should watch, let me know. All right. We'll see you next time.